Hello everyone, welcome back to Let's Play Portal, 1986 computer novel written by Rob Swigert. This is the Amiga version. We are hopefully honing in on our narrative conclusion. We, I think we've come to our ultimate geographical location, uh, which is appropriately enough called Terminus. If you'd like to find out um, what's happened up to this point in our experience with this particular piece of interactive fiction, then uh, please do check out the playlist of previous streams and videos. Um, you'll be able to find out lots more and, um, and meet some of the, the characters that we have encountered. Um, but for this episode, I would like to do something a little different. I'm going to mix up our usual routine. We're going to something of a habit as to how I approach getting information out of this system that's presented to us. But I'm going to do things a little differently, at least in a different order anyway. I'm going to start off with life support. So by my reckoning, we have five character statistics left to look at. Um, we last did, uh, we last looked at Trixie Chin. So yeah, so there's five there. So I'm going to start off uh, just looking at character stats. So it's going to be Corin Williams this time. Um, and I'll run through all those and then I will tackle the other categories and we'll, I'll explain that when we come to it. So here's Corin loading in. Corin Williams, uh, born on the 11th of April 2045. I What day is it today? I'm recording on the 12th of April 2023, still in, still in the future almost an exact number of years. So let's um, let's write down Corin's name before I lose my train of thought entirely. Um, so I'll put that on the, the notepad that you can see here. So Corin assigned female, um, born in Springfield as many of her contemporaries who are traveling with Peter. There we go, back in the game window. Um, and these are the um, biological uh, measurements that have been taken from some unspecified point in uh, Corin's life. So let's have a look at blood pressure. Okay. We have temperature. I like that. Respiration and GSR. Heart rate and EG. There we go. Tension. Mounting. DNA hormones. That's DNA and hormones. Not really, well, yeah, I guess you can conflate the two ideas to some extent. Uh, neurotransmitters. That's a good little pixel drawing of a brain, isn't it? There we go. And glycogen. There you go, look at that. Lovely. Okay, so we'll get that's part one of Corin's statistics. And then we need to get a Wasatch for um, uh, more social data, I would say. So we get out to the final page, or well, what I hope is the final page of character stats. Um, we'll just wait for uh, that record to load in, and then we can have a look at Corin's family tree. Okay, so uh, Corin Williams is the child of Nina Williams and Scott Williams. Scott Williams is the child of Yolanda Williams and Jose Williams. Nina Williams is the child of Nancy Abram and Frederick Abram. So what's going on there? So let's have a look at the physiology and ESP for Corin. Um, there we go, low body fat, um, everything else pretty much about 50%. Basic core IQ, so this is gonna be a set of categories, uh, usually subject areas, um, and I guess it's a measurement of aptitude for those, um, art being the, the highest in this case. All right, and then we're straight on to psychology. Um, 
background. I think we get some uh, rather subjective, even more subjective things here. So we get an emotional analysis. There we are. We get uh, personal growth. And basic core IQ. So this is a slightly different uh, slice of uh, of science. Uh, sorry, science. I read science of subject aptitudes. Uh, these are all around fifty percent as well. All right, and then last but not least is EdMod, uh, which is the um, learning and education. Uh, section of the the global database. So for Corin, that will have uh, these things. So, but more basic core IQ we can look at in a moment. There we go. Yeah. So again, a slightly different um, comparison of stats. There, we can see writing and and linguistics uh, lower than the others. Um, and then an assessment of memory, which I think is that same pixel drawing. Of a brain, but inside a head. This way, fair enough. Um, and then social adjustment. There we go. And uh, logic. There. Brilliant. So we have we have looked at Corin now. Okay. So my plan for. Um, the order in which we'll do things is we need to go to a category first and once we get to mid 10. Um, I will have a look at Homer for Homer's problems because I haven't been doing that for a long time. We had a look at that early on in our playthrough. So there are so many answered questions. Ah, oh, sometimes Homer gives you specific directions of where to go. So my thought was to follow any specific directions until. Um, I got to a point where Homer was flashing uh, to indicate that I should come back for more story and see if that worked. But Homer doesn't have a suggestion there. So I'll keep on doing the uh, usual rounds, uh, left to right, top to bottom. We'll crack into uh, old Psylink here to see if there are any um, things there. No. So many unanswered questions, Homer. All right, well, uh, looks like I'm on my own then for this particular section. All right, SciTech. Um, no, nothing there because it would have uh, jumped us to, straight to the end of the list and the new entry if there were. History. I think we might be crawling for just one, one entry again, probably. Oh, uh, it's Terminus Sorel Report Summary 2. I don't know if we'll get an image for this one. No, it's a corruption data crystal failure. Okay, let's read a Terminus Sorel Report Summary. Sorel spoke of his impatience, his waiting, his speculation. The brief reading he'd seen indicated a vast bubble under the ancient ice, a bubble that extended up a valley in the slope of the under-ice mountain nearby. Such bubbles were extremely rare, and if the reading were correct, this was certainly the largest ever found. During the second 24-hour period inside the tent, his compass needles began to swing violently. He tried taking another sounding from inside the tent, but the radar scanners were bulky, I'm not quite sure what that means in this context, and his readings fuzzy and imprecise. Next day, the weather broke for a few hours and he hurried out to take his reading. This reading confirmed the first. There was a bowl beneath the ice. He moved as quickly as he could in the direction of the black rock poking above the surface of the ice, trying to find the course of the bubble while carrying his bulky equipment. The crawler broke down before he could see the non-attack, so he made do where he was, noting that the bubble seemed to extend for several miles. He carefully recorded the position in relation to the non-attack, and then retreated to his tent as the storm swept down again. Once more the compass behaved erratically, 
swinging to and fro as if they had forgotten they were magnetic south again, seeking magnetic south again. When the storm cleared for good, Sorel packed up and headed back toward the main body, carrying his precise radar recordings with him. It was on his way back that he found the opening in the ice. He lay for two hours on his belly, staring down into the yawning pit that was, as far as he knew, the only opening into the bubble, into his bubble. The only opening into his bubble. He saw, far below, through ragged cloud and fog, a dry land flickering in orange light. Finally, he pressed on, only to discover that the main body was not where he had left it. He searched for another day before switching on his emergency beacon and settling down to wait. The south magnetic pole had shifted again during his days out on the ice, and he never located his lost dry valley again. Even the non-attack failed him, since it was only one of several peaks high enough to break the surface, and he was never certain which one he'd located. The bubble and its dry valley were curiosities for a few years that gradually subsided into legend, forgotten but for the wild traveller's stories told about the terminus, the lost oasis of the high plateau. Okay. Um, confirming what we could infer from uh, things we had already read, which is something of a pattern. Um, let's get into military. I wonder if Homer's got anything to say yet once we've so sort of cracked in here. Nothing in military. Come to home, I have a file ready for you. Okay. Alright, well, I'm, I'm going to finish my round. Um, because, yeah, I might as well at this point. So we'll have a look at the next character on our Who is going to be... Um, Jose Aka Akashi. Jose Akashi. Could possibly be um, Jose. Um, I'm not sure. I think I'll stick with Jose for now. Okay, so that's back in our notepad. So let's have a look at Jose. Assigned male, uh, born on the 19th of February 2049 in Springfield. This is Jose's blood pressure. There. And temperature. Oh, there. Uh, respiration and GSR. Lastly, uh, heart rate and EEG. Just so. Tension. Likewise, DNA and hormones, verily, neurotransmitters, voila, and glycogen as you like it. There we go. Um, brilliant, so that's checked off that portion. Uh, let's check in with geography just in case anything's popped up there. We are still um, thinking about geography quite a lot at the moment. Uh, no, nothing new there. Okay, so let's go back to Wasatch and have a look at Jose's other stats there. Have a look at your family tree. All right, so Jose Akashi is the child of Paula Akashi and Edward Akashi. Edward Akashi is the child of Cassie Akashi and Saul Akashi. And Paula Akashi is the child of Susan Hajam and Warren Hajam. So I, again, I'm wondering if that um, character naming algorithm has, uh, has just popped in there or whether uh, this person is any distant relation to uh, Raz Hajam, another character in the storyline, but um, with no direct connection as far as we know. 
So I'll look at physiology and ESP there. And then uh, our first selection of basic core IQ subjects. There we go. Uh, highest in music there. We will next move on to psychology here. Okay. Okay, and we'll have a look at emotion. And personal growth. There. And basic core IQ. There we go. Uh, music again, higher than everything else. Uh, central processing uh, will be our last place to find any general entries that could trigger story sections. Nothing new there, though. So we'll pop in Edward. Let's have a look. So we'll start at the bottom this time with social adjustment. There we go. I'll have a look at memory. Oh, uh, very high attention, short term memory. My ability to learn, uh, not much ability with long term memory. There you go, interesting. Okay, music again, much higher than anything else in basic core IQ, and then finally for logic, we've got those. There we go. So that does, that seems like it's been quite short order, but it has brought us around to home. So Let's see what having a look at that one bit of history has uh, has done for Homer. Okay, we've got a Peter Devore entry in the second narrative block, which is the um, more third person focused section. This means. Peter said, when the narrative ended, that all we have to do is go to the head of the valley, and an attack marks the place. The ice should be thin enough to open there, and we can walk down. He called up the territorial map, which bristled with peaks, small sharp edges of rock, blades and points and shards of black primeval stone drowned in the infinite ice. Which one? A woman asked softly. Peter smiled. Good question. I would say this one. He touched an insubstantial peak, the merest projection of imaginary light. And of course, he was right. Oh, I don't know why. Of course he was right. Alright, has that um, cascaded anything else into being? Okay, it's a narrative one section, which is more uh, first person from Homer's perspective, although it does fold in third person narrative as well confusingly sometimes I have lied do you know that yes I am a liar I have failed somehow to capture what Peter is what he means oh by then he was certainly more than the boy he had been he had grown the way world net circuits had grown he had added abilities and skills in the same way. Yet it would seem that Peter is too good to be true. A hero grown larger than life. A man not complex, maybe. Not complex, perhaps, but certain of what he was doing, where he was going. Did he have no doubts, no fears? Did he take no false steps? Make no dangerous or ill-advised decisions? Could he have been all I have said he is? Of course not. Peter was a man. Yet, he has recorded this for me. He felt that he was a token, a pawn, 
moved by forces far outside himself, moved by mentor, by the accidental misconnection that put him inside Silink instead of the Wasatch database. He'd been a boy of stormy enthusiasms, which too soon passed, an introverted child of indifferent talents, a restless adolescent with a fondness for strawberry yoghurt and medieval fantasies. Now he was the leader of what seemed, from the place above the terminus bubble, a desperate expedition with a hopeless objective, under a compulsion to continue despite all he felt and thought and knew. He looked then at Larin, who looked back with trust. He gazed around at the others, at Shem and Rover and the women and men of his small band. He looked up and watched the small swift speck of an observation satellite flickering in and out behind the aurora, and knew that despite the sensitivity of the instruments aboard that distant cup of life and intelligence, he could not be seen, that he and the others were invisible, lost in the emptiness, themselves specks of nothing on top of nothing. They were shielded from world net sensors, cut off from the human world. Peter has said he felt and saw all these things in the moment after he touched the projected non attack and stated that this was the one. Do you believe this? Do I believe it? Could Peter take a false step anywhere along the way to the migration? With every word I feel that I am lying. I say Peter did this and Laren said that, knowing as soon as the words are formed that they are lies, all of them. In my lying I feel fear. Is this what it means to be on the brink of something vast and vastly unknown? To be poised at the edge of an abyss and know there is nothing to do but fall? The ice flowed. The Sestrugi marched to the sea a few metres a year. That opening in the ice moved as well, opened and closed and opened again like the breathing of some vast unhappy beast, a beast of ice with an iron heart. In its lungs was a forest. The ice flowed around the non-attack. Did the bubble flow with it, flow and shrink under that terrible pressure as the ice hit the underground mountain? Did it part and flow around, or was that bubble trapped forever in its under-ice valley? Peter did not know. He only knew that he had hung 9,000 feet above a valley floor with Larin at his side, and seen the strange light and dark landscape of an unknown land. It's all non-known sense. Such legends are silly, impossible dreams of some distant paradise. A cliché, an Eden of innocence and bliss where no one grows old and dies, where there is plenty and health and happiness, where it is warm. Our probes are down there now. I must keep telling myself this. Terminus is real. It exists. It is not warm, though, and people do grow old and die, even there, or would if there were any people. Peter took them to the non attack, isolated and unnamed. I lie, I lie. He found the proper valley, and he led them in and down, and so they descended into terminus, skirting fallen boulders and dry rock, tumbled moraine and scree. Twisted geology from the world's own infancy, and on either side of them rose walls of rock, walls of ice, and overhead the ice hung and thickened and oppressed, while below the light grew strange and dark and red. So Homer's um, crisis of uh, identity and purpose uh, growing more manifest, I think. We get another Peter Devore section. This seems to lead Homer on to, to further invention, I suppose. Peter sat away from the others, with his back against a stone. Down slope he could see the tops of what were clearly trees. And trees in this place were so strange and impossible he felt they must be a mirage. Through the forest a stream wound its way down the valley toward a distant and invisible further wall where the ice once more closed in. It was warmer. He could feel that. Moisture condensed on the rock behind him. Small droplets collected and slowly dripped onto the rocky floor 
beneath his feet. Overhead, clouds moved, twisted, fragmented and reformed. Light mist fell from the low heavens. Terminus was damp and cold and uncomfortable, but it was unquestionably real. So does that unlock anything else for us? Apparently it does. Back to section one. This is Homer in dialogue with himself, really. How I lie. You see, I tell what I think happened, that I know from records happened, what Peter tells me happened. I believe he sat with his back to this fallen tumble of primeval rock, seated on another stone with a flat surface, with his legs stretch out before him, watching the mist fall onto the forest below. I believe he felt a burden and a sadness then, since he says he did. Yet I lie. Paradox. He sat with his back to a rock, and sighed, and thought of wonder. Yes, I wondered if we were going to return to wonder in any particular form, because wonder's been um, floating in suspended animation and dreaming mostly for this story. We've got two new sections of narrative. This is interesting. Let's see where we go from here. Yet he felt at his back the solid lifeless stone, since the mist falling and rising around him could taste the scents of beech and pine on the cold breeze of Terminus. I think you're lying, Homer. You don't know what Peter's olfactory sense has experienced. Okay, and then, oh, okay, so another narrative one has popped up, but there's still another narrative two to get to. Do I lie? Of course. It's very much in dialogue um, with himself at this point. Okay, back to the final, uh, so far anyway, final narrative two section. He knew all the while he sat back to the stone, he sat back to stone with his feet splayed out. Very strange. This is a very strange back and forth that we're getting here. I like it. I like um, that it's kind of pointless other than to reinforce the unreliability of this narrative and the narrator. Um, it's an interesting way of doing it as we're sort of nominally interacting with the narrator. All right, but that kind of doesn't really give us any hooks to go off on, does it? Which is interesting, I suppose. Well, let's pop in mid 10. So, uh, failing any other hints as to where to look, I'll just do the usual run around. So at this point, Homer's saying, the golden thread binds all consciousness. That's very instructive, thank you. Um, I am starting to feel a little concerned about Homer's integrity. As a... Well, not just uh, integrity in terms of veracity, but integrity as in whether whether home is going to hold together as an AI. Okay, all right. Well, we'll uh, default to our systematic search of these categories, and we will get one more character in before we finish this episode. So that will leave a two for for a future episode. Is any time I um, try to predict how how much more reading there is to um, to see a conclusion, I'm I'm always off. There is always more. There is always more um, more detail to tip back into the um, the convenient narrative jumps that we might have taken before. So uh, we're back through to military already with nothing new to show for it. Still I think is Homer going on still about the golden thread? Okay, brilliant. Alright, so we're down to Warren Abram. Again, that's, that's a surname that we've read in another 
family tree earlier on. Just pop one in if I can hit the right keys on the keyboard. There we go, lovely. And I will get us back to the game window. So, Warren Abram, assigned male, uh, born the 29th of April 2053 in Springfield, on the Springfield crew. Um, and this is Warren's blood pressure at some unspecified point in time. And temperature. There. And respiratory and GSR. There we are. Heart rate and EEG. There we go. Some tension for everyone. There. Uh, some DNA and hormones. Some neurotransmitters. We are one high, one low, and some glycogen. There we go, beautiful. Okay, so we've seen those. Um, we'll pop in geography. There's only geography and central processing to go. Central processing might be the one we need to get to because Homer was talking about the probes, and central processing, central processing is the one that sends those out. So that might be the place to look. Before, before we get there, um, we do need to read some more about Warren. So let's find Warren on this list. There. And we'll pop up the family tree in just a second. Here we go. Okay, so Warren Abram is the child of Penny Abram and Arnold Abram. Arnold Abram is the child of Sarah Abram and Barney Abram. Penny Abram is the child of Kay Javino and Jimmy Javino. Now, Jimmy Javino sounds like a character I'd like to read about. Physiology and ESP. There we are. Um, pretty comparable to most characters we've seen, I think. Uh, basic core IQ. There we go. Uh, higher aptitude for music, it seems to say. And then we'll um, get straight into the psychology of the situation as soon as we're able. Okay, let's think about emotion for a minute. And then we'll contemplate personal growth. And then we will have a look at some more basic core IQ subjects. There we are, music the highest of those again. Alrighty, so we've got central processing next. So I'm thinking there might be some um, some allusion to probes or maybe wonder even. So there seem to be things that have um, cropped up. Yeah, so it's something central processing ref. 21563 stroke AP. Let's see what that is. And does it have an image? No, it's classified in a nice um, magenta and green, though. Homer has requested a Scilink download alpha priority. Central Processing has forwarded request with compliance order ref number 98489 for parity. Scilink will flag Homer request. Well, that seems to send us to Silink, doesn't it? So I'm tempted to have a little peek there in a minute. So, what? Yeah. So, what is Homer up to? I do kind of like that Homer has um, has outed um, himself as um, as an agent in this um, this situation. But it does add a bit more dramatic tension than um, just reading about things long since past has been doing. Um, and it does kind of, kind of excuse the flatness of most of the the human characters that have been uh, written. 
Uh, right, so Warren Abram, last set of stats. I'll go memory. There we go. Uh, looks reasonable to me. We'll hop right over to logic on this side. And then we'll go up to basic core IQ, last set of subjects. There we go, music top in, top in the, the pops there, and social adjustment, like that. There we go, lovely. All right, let's pop back in and check in with Silink because we may be too soon, we may just go to home first before something happens, but it's worth a check, isn't it? As we're trying to break, we're trying to break the pattern uh, this episode, yeah, Vega Silink download four. Oh, so Vega, that suggests to me that perhaps this is about uh, checking on Wanda. Oh, we may we may even get an image. It'd be nice. I like the little illustrations that appear. I like to to see how they're using their. No, that's just a crystal failure. Sorry. Homer requests Vega Silink download. She was 26, her dark hair twisted high and bound simply. Overhead, empty skies vanish with a curious shifting quality. She could not look up at that strange sky, teasing her eye always outward, never satisfying with a solid shape. She walked slowly, the small tips of her golden sandals nosing from under her long gown, the gown itself shimmering with diamond sparks that threw the strange, almost violet skies outward. And as she walked, she looked demurely down. Peter floated in some middle distance, watching her. He tried to read her mood from the solemn, almost shy way she walked, the clean-set line of her jaw. He felt the extent of her world was infinite. There were no walls, no horizons, no limits. When he spoke, she did not answer, but walked without progress, the small golden tips of her sandals moving in and out, in and out. He called her again, but there was no response. He felt his way through the equations, the relationships between quantum mental activity and the tensed web of shape and energy in the universe cried out for action. A place to stand and a lever long enough could move the world. The world needed moving. The suffocation of its benign authority grew ever more deadly. Peter groped through the limitless dark toward Wanda, yet could approach no closer. He turned away and heard her call. Peter? Her voice was hesitant. Peter? He tried to answer without turning. Yes, I'm here. Peter? The equations glowed. They pointed toward the spot, the lever. The numbers were too large, though. Sons of suns would be needed, a flux of axions more dense and vast than anything the starships could seize and squeeze to make them go. Such a small thing in the human mind, so puny and weak, yet how rich and complex. Peter pushed through dark, velvet dark that was more than an absence of light. His was a nightmare walk, the motionless tread of panic. Long, unfeeling fingers held him back. He struggled against the fear, against the heavy, wet clutch of his desperation. There was a twist as if something broke, and Wanda vanished into that awful, not quite violet, non-sky. Something in the depths of the world, through which he tried to make his way, appeared before him at every turn, a form without a face. Peter stopped struggling suddenly. He let himself feel the tides moving through the substance of his flesh. Did he fall? Was his body altered through pain, forged and annealed through genetic fires, drifting down and away? He felt the distance between himself and Wanda yawn wide. It was not, he felt, the terrible plunge of her ship through space that took her away from him, but the some small tidal force that increased their separation by minute increments. The dark figure flickered for a moment into sudden lightning, then vanished into a greater black once more. The shape had a name then, the name of his fear and uncertainty. Where am I? Peter asked, but the figure heard him no better than Wanda had. He was in a sea that was not salt, was not water. Sensations of increasing pressure pushed at him as he drifted. He froze. His downward drift was halted by the suspension of all motion. Nothing held him, yet he was gripped tightly. If he could kick, he might move, yet where he now found himself there would be no motion, no kick to free him. 
Did he see, far overhead, a distant sun? So faint it was a mere fancy on the blank undersurface of this empty sea. Do I lie? Of course. He was not alone. Another presence mocked him. I did nothing, the figure said. Nothing. You stopped yourself. All my efforts, and you stopped yourself. How is it you can speak to me? Peter asked. But there was no answer. The sleeper dreams the universe, Peter said. No answer. Where am I? No answer. What will happen when he awakes? When he awakes, awake. Sound was more terrible than silence had been. Close at hand, vast buildings fell. Metal rent apart in a cataclysm too grand and awful to understand. Huge undersea tankers collided in the cold dark without warning and exploded in awful roaring and terrible sudden light. A hollow booming filled all the dark universe with pain. Waves of sound beat on the shores of Peter's mind in endless repetition, one after another, without pause. Mountains fell. The earth groaned. Seas lifted sheets of ice two miles thick and let them fall one against another. With the sound came more lights, the bright flicker of phosphines inside the eyeball itself, faces that stared in shock and horror for a fragmentary moment before whirling away. Wanda called in pain. Peter? Now that seems to me very reminiscent of things we have previously read and odd bits of phrasing we have previously read in other sections. So I wonder if it's an extension of a previous bit of text. Let's just check this previous Vega download out. Yeah, it is, but have they been... Um, no, that seems to be exactly the same. That's weird, isn't it? So Homer's is getting the same download and similarly um, authored. Yes, yeah, so that seems to be exactly the same entry, which I don't know if that's intentional, but it's it's weird. Okay, so we can't go back to those any of those things. That. That is weird. Homer, what do you have to say for yourself? Come to Homer. I have a fire waiting for you. Hmm. Yeah, so what's what's going on with that repetition, Homer? Okay, negative one. Don't explain yourself. Could Peter answer that question? I keep wondering if there was an answer. Even then, some compulsion, some force that drove Peter on and the others to follow. Um, and what question are we referring to there, Homer? Was that the file you had for me? Oh, there's another one. Let's hope it's more about the rock. He looked up. Overhead, the ice sheet shifted and screamed. Blocks the size of ships fell crashing into the dry course of the valley. Rock and fragments of ice tumbled past him. A tearing sound as ice fractured somewhere deep in its own bellies washed over him. Laren appeared suddenly, her face pale with shock and grief beneath the dark silken fur of her head. She reached for him. Peter stood. Hush, he said. It's nothing. Just the ice shifting in its flow. It's Shelley, she said. She was there one minute, looking out over the valley, and then she was gone. She's dead. Ice fall? Larin nodded. Even the ice is gone. It fell and took her with it. Trees down below are shattered at the edge of the forest. This is a dangerous place, Peter. Why are we here? Let's go, was all he said, and led the way down. They found Shelley at the edge of the forest, amid the vast splintered trunks and limbs of a grove of beech trees. Shem was looking back the way they had come. It's closed up, he said. We can't get out, the ice closed up on us. Peter nodded. She was always quiet, he said. Always reassuring, she soothes. Remember, back in the Agni, how calm she was, with what grace she calmed the others. I remember. Always fragile, a delicate person, and not strong. She trained hard back in Springfield and on the Agni, but 
She wasn't strong, not in her body. Spirit, though. She had spirit. They buried her, another one who would not make the migration. Later Shem said, Where were you? Up there? I'm not certain. Below the cellular level, something pulled me down. Or someone. You know what Mentor said? Matter is the pattern mind makes. I was pulled down there, where dead matter rules. No life. Just at the brink of DNA, perhaps. The beginnings of genetic change. My father was there. Your father? Regent Sable. His face, his voice, calling me. He wants us to stop. So I think, unless I'm really into it too much, that does allude more directly to the Psylink narrative that we read. I think they they match up a bit there. Oh, we've got a little bit more to read. The forest was untouched, trackless, dark. Orange light flickered from time to time on the distant undersides of the ice, on the perpetual clouds that moved restlessly to and fro inside this great cavern in the ice. How can they live? Laren asked. How can there be a forest here? This must be the oldest forest in the world, Peter answered. These beaches grew in Antarctica when it still was still part of Pangaea, the first continent. It's a magma vent somewhere down here that heats the place enough, and sends up light enough to feed the trees during the long winter. Why wasn't this place discovered? We've had satellites scanning Antarctica for over a hundred years. Radar, infrared, UV, magnetic flux, everything. This place should show up like a beacon. Peter shook his head. I don't know, but I'd guess that between the ice, the aurora, the geology of this place, and the narrow scan path of the satellites themselves, it's well hidden. Certainly no one's been here before us. It was then that Rover reported they'd found the building. What? Building! Uh, could you possibly be leaving me upon a cliffhanger, Homer? No, okay, there's more, okay, yeah, no, let's just keep, let's keep going, yeah. It wasn't much of a building. Oh. <laughs> now it is even less. Just a rude shelter made by a hand of deadfall and cut limbs. It sat in a clearing, a rough square shape roofed with planks and stone, surrounded by moss and ferns and lichen-covered stone. Uh, I think that's a repetition of stone there. Hang on. In the intervals of relative quiet, they could hear running water. Then the booming and creaking of the ice would start up again. The mists would close in once more, and the trickle would fade. Some dry valley, someone murmured. They stood in a semicircle and looked at the building. Moss clung to the rough logs, in places still untrimmed, the grey smooth bark fuzzed and damp with the mists. Primeval ferns grew higher than the sill of the one window, filled the doorless opening. Inside was darkness. It looks like a topside gazebo, Laren said, like an entrance. Who built this thing? It's crazy. Shem scuffed his boot through the dank hummus. They left their hummus? Droplets sprayed away from the ferns he disturbed. Peter moved to the door, entered. His form vanished into the dark. When he came out, he said, The roof is sound. It's dry. Come on. The groaning of the ice was muffled inside. Their glow lamps revealed rough logs inside, but dry and clean. Through the window, the green ferns swayed in orange-tinted light as the rain fell. The floor was rough-lazed planking, black from the heat that formed them, blistered from the explosions of green wood as they were sliced. Looking at it, Peter said, Well, at least we know now. We know no primitive man dressed in skins is going to leave out this. This floor was made with relatively modern equipment. There's a trapdoor, Rover said. They heaved it up, revealing crude stone steps leading down. Peter nodded. Mentor. He said. He knew where this place was. He knew we'd find it. The lights came on as they descended. <gasps> Secret lab! Say no more. 
Well, I mean, you can if you want to, but I'll go in the episodes fairly soon. Yeah, I'll go out a bit more. The hut is a ruin, but the lights still come on. Our probes can confirm Terminus. Confirm the laboratory under the thin soil. Peter and the others were there, certainly. Why do I feel this is all unreal? A dream? Is it because Peter sank down into his own precellular self and met his father there? Uh, it does sound like a dream. Such things should not be possible. All the data on this subject in the Matrix suggests it is impossible. I have queried Silink repeatedly, I'd noticed. I get packets of data by the thousands in return, all flagged anecdotal evidence. To the Silink node, this means it cannot be trusted. Human beings, Silink repeats, are unreliable. Their perceptions are coloured by subjectivity. They do not possess standard yardsticks by which to measure their observations. They are emotional, meaning that their understanding is filtered through chemical changes in their own bodies, and the rush of hormones and enzymes of fear, or elation or grief. They see things that do not exist, believe in things for which there is not one shred of evidence. I have wondered how we could exist if human beings were so unreliable. Silink has no answer. We run, therefore we are. The laboratory is there. It is empty. Laminar flow cleans the work, sp work spaces. Electrostatic discharges repel dust. The crystals line their niches still, though the probe, though probes removed the precious laden jar for analysis in Geneva. We are close. I am close. I can feel it, the end of my search. We will understand what happened. We will understand what man has wrought upon himself. Why humans have left us here, alone. The excitement I feel is spreading. Other nodes awaken. Their voices clamour. Circuits come to life all over the planet, on the LP5s. Farside antennae turn even now toward Vega. The Anomaly Dum dum dum, oh you were just headed for a... Even cliffy hangery cliffhanger. Oh my goodness, you keep... okay. Are we... Um, alright, we'll keep rolling. The laboratory mentor had left for Peter DeVore was small. There was little equipment, only a room with ten workstations, hollow projection, computation and simulation, data banks in a small matrix. No different, really, from similar labs at Psyche, or back in Geneva or Springfield or Kuala Lumpur. The other rooms included a small refectory, sleeping cells, a gym, sanitation. I'm glad there was sanitation. Down here, the sound of ice overhead was dim, a background din that gradually became a kind of music to the 14 people at work. This would be their home for more than a decade, they knew, and they must grow accustomed to the sounds and sights of their home. So, what? Another decade's going to pass? Peter continued to train. He drove the others as well, two hours a day, honing their bodies. They all could stand as he had done on the ball of one foot, motionless save that incremental turn. They could stand perfectly still, blindfolded, and wait for an attack which, when it finally came, suddenly and unexpectedly, was deflected easily, without sound or wasted motion. We must be down there at the matter level, Peter told them. We must know from the inside what it is to make the structure of our own bodies from the patterns of force and energy with nothing but our own minds. Then we must expand that mind to encompass others. Our bodies are the shape of our discipline, nothing more. They give us a focus, a form with which to work. Wanda has no body. She can teach us what that means. Does Wanda have no body? I thought Wanda had a body. I thought that was part of what was going on. Um... Well, that was confusing. Oh, right. Well, if you could leave... Oh, I kind of wish you'd left me at the entry before, to be honest. That was a better episode end. But, oh, there we go. All right, they're standing on the balls of their feet. There you go. That's the end of the episode. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining me. Um, we will continue next time. Um, 
pace pace pending um and yeah surprises will await i'm sure thank you thank you once again for um for your patience on this voyage i hope you're enjoying it and um i'll see you again soon take care bye bye